Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm talking about pirate, pronounced correctly, pi R T pirate. <laughs> um, but let me talk first about what I want to do. Um, first, I want to have a way to render my scenes from indoor to outdoor, and I mean from planet, really, planet scale to indoor. That's my first challenge, or at least I try that. The second challenge, I want to have good quality. And good quality means I want to use global illumination. So I really I don't want um, to have the result we see in the left. I want to have the result in the right. So if you paint your wall green or red, <laughs> then you see on the floor it's also a little bit greenish and reddish. So that's global illumination. So we really um, follow the path of light. So let me show you my previous work. What did I do the past 12, yeah, 12 to 13 years? <laughs> um, I created a virtual globe, started in 2005. You probably know Google Earth or other virtual globe technologies. Um, I created my own. It's called Open Web Globe and was originally written in C++, and then in 2011, um, with the advent of WebGL, we moved to JavaScript. Wow. I say that at a Python conference, yes, throw the tomatoes. <laughs> okay, it's really a JavaScript library, and you can do some cool stuff like adding um, much geodata, you can have orthophotos added, you can even have point clouds added, large-scale point clouds, we had um, millions of points, billions of points on, on the virtual globe. So the data processing part was also written in C++ and was moved to Python. So there is the Python part, so you can put away all the tomatoes again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, let me show you how it looked like. Um, here we had a data set from Switzerland um, um, about I think three terabyte of data. And you can fly around. You don't see really buildings here. You see the elevation model and the orthophotos. So in 2013, a master thesis started to add buildings. But the big problem about buildings is where do you get buildings of the whole planet if you are not Google? Or if you don't have a budget of a few billion dollars. <laughs> So one solution we came up with is why don't we use OpenStreetMap data? So maybe you know OpenStreetMap, it's a 2D map. Um, um, many people do um, mapping with crowdsourcing, so you can really um, add your own buildings. And there are some people who actually um, um, add some tags of the roof shape, for example, or of the building height, etc. So uh, what if we take this data and create 3D model of the whole world? So that's what we did. You see um, on the top left a scene in Switzerland where people didn't really add the building height, so we estimated a standard building height there. On the right side top is New York. It's much better there. Um, uh, someone or some people really did add the real shapes of the buildings, and that's really inside the, the OpenStreetMap dataset. And um, bottom right, we had we wanted to add some we call that buildings of interest, some some textured object in a, a buildings of really interest where you, where you have a textured object and you can replace that from the OpenStreetMap dataset. Um, on the bottom left, you see uh, the Forbidden City in Beijing, and you see there um, the, the typical roofs are also not there yet. So let me show you very, very briefly how it worked. We also used the OpenStreetMap data as ground layer and added some buildings. Here is a building of interest, pyramid. Yeah, not very, <laughs> not very special. You can zoom around. Then you can go to Another city, I think the movie froze. No? Okay, you, it's just slow. Then let's go to London. And you see the loading speed. Okay, it loads. Some buildings appear. It's, we simulated a little bit um, bad bandwidth there, I have to admit. But it's a common bandwidth you have with, with um, I think, a uh, normal mobile phone. 
so 3G, and then the buildings of interest are loaded too. You see the bridge is not complete because this is missing in the OpenStreetMap dataset. Okay, that's what it looked like. And how did we do it? Um, it's quite easy, we use some projection. I don't want to go into details here. Also with Python, there's a great library called Proj4, where many, many um, projection systems, cartographic projection systems are included. And everything is, of course, quad tree based. It's the same principle like 2D maps, where you can zoom in and zoom out. The only difference is that you look at the virtual globe from a side, so you have different level of details at the same time. And you also have to um, consider different tile types. So you have the classic orthophotos, 2D imagery. You can have 2D vector data. You can have a 2D elevation tile. Why 2D? Because it just is a height map, basically. And this height map is converted to a 3D model, this yellow shape we see there. Okay, so. We also added some special geometry tiles um, with special triangulations to have a better quality. Um, and we mainly used um, the GDAL library um, with the Python binding to access raster data, including the elevation. Okay, that was the previous work. So, yeah, I was not really happy with it. Um, you, you saw the rendering speed is not really that great, and another problem is the ease of navigation is not that great. Maybe all of you know Google Earth, most people look at it one time, maybe two times, and then they end up using Google Maps. That's the truth, unfortunately. So, uh, and uh, another problem is um, the support for mobile devices is not that great. WebGL runs on mobile devices, uh, but you really need the latest, latest and most expensive device to run such a scene. And of course, the most important argument, I want more Python. So we came up with some ideas. Why don't we just take um, the system of a 2D mapping system and render it from the side? So you actually see the 3D um, building, but it's just a 2D map. So it's the same like a 2D map. So um, you can have a city model, um, for example, Rimini, in six level of details. And if you do six level of details, you probably have two to th uh, three buildings per tile. So that's not much. If you have two to three buildings per tile, you can really render that extremely fast. So the good thing is you never need the whole city model in memory, even when you, you render that, because you only render one tile at a time. And this means the rendering is really fast, and the best part is I can run all these processes in the cloud. So this can be really done with, in parallel by request, or I can pre-render it. So how it looks like, I have a zoom level N, I didn't make too many just for, for this um, slide, so you understand the principle. And I say, okay, in zoom level N, I render it in the best quality with an offline ray tracer. And then with image processing, I create the remaining level of details. So let me show you an example. We used um, open data set of the city of Rotterdam. Um, we used it because um, it consists of city GML files of around 3 GB and has um, textures of about 500 GB. So here's the browser. We enter, um, yeah, we enter the URL and you see, not even one second later, you can interact in this scene. And the good thing is we can do some more stuff like interaction. So we can select some parts we can zoom in, zoom out. So now we wonder how did we do this selection in a 2D map? That's also quite easy. We use a very old principle from the 1990s called the G-buffer. A G-buffer is a group of image types. First we have the color information, just the color of the buildings. The second is a normal map where you store the normals of each pixel. The third is a classification type of map. 
It's a color ID map, so for every building or every building group, you have a color. So with this color, you can get the ID, the ID back. And then the fourth, I didn't really put the picture here because it makes no sense, is the depth map. For every pixel, you can get the depth value. And with this depth value, you can recalculate the exact 3D position in the scene. So you can even measure within this system. So um, this is the principle. Now the hard part was how do we render it? So the first we did, we used RenderMan. It's the best render package of the world. Then we used Pothray, a great package. Here we see on the, on the left is a scene um, created with ray tracing. You see, yeah, and this projector is not that good, but you see the texture quality is much better. And we even have shadow there on the, on the right side. And on the left side is a, is a classic WebGL-based viewer. So we used Pothray, but the problem of Pothray was that we did not have a good support of the depth map and of the normal map because we want to have a high precision depth map with 60, at least 50, 64 um, bits per pixel. So the only solution, of course, was to create our own render, and that's where Pirate is coming from. Um, Pirate is a ray tracer which uses Python 3.5. It must be 3.5. It can't be less than 3.5. Um, I will talk about that in an instant. Um, the primary goal is we want to render high quality images. We want to support several different um, rendering techniques and different lighting models. And of course, we want to have a Jupyter integration so we can render um, images in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, but the most important, as I mentioned before, is we want to have precise depth maps, normal maps, and object ID maps. And we want to create that in the same render step, so we don't have to render four images. So we just render one time, and we get all this information. Commercial and open source ray tracers do not have that support. And also an important thing is we don't want to have a fancy GUI like Blender. We want to run this in the cloud, and we want to have it really as a, as a command line render. So let me show you a, a simple Hello World. Um, it's highly uh, packaged into different sub-modules. So you have a math, geometry, material, camera, and so on module. We have a render module, which can be abstracted, so you can add your own render. So the first, you create your camera, you create your scene, you add triangles or geometry to your scene, you specify the material, and then you create a render and render it. So now you may think, why do we do that this complicated? We actually write code to, to render a scene. So with this, it's quite easy to support different formats, and we, at the end, we have a, a Python program which describes the scene. This is how the Jupyter Notebook integration looks like. So you can really add your um, geometry there, you can render it, and you see it there. One thing I didn't mention yet is it doesn't really, it's pure Python. It does, does not depend on any library. However, for, for this Jupyter integration, we check if PIL is available to create an image, and we check, of course, if Jupyter is available so we can um, um, create a result in HTML. So let me quickly show the principle of ray tracing. It's really a very simple principle. Um, we have a light source, and from this light source, we have rays, and maybe these rays, they hit an object. And maybe this object um, reflects these rays, and maybe if very, very lucky, these rays hit the camera. So maybe we shoot one trillion rays and 20, 30 rays hit the camera. So you see it's quite expensive. So, uh, um, and then some people came up with the idea why not um, do that backwards. We start from the camera, we shoot some rays, we hit an object, and then we see if there is um, a light or maybe it's occluded, so we have shadow. And with this principle, we only need the minimum one ray per resulting pixel. 
So if you have full HD, you only need two million rays. I'm coming back to that. You all know how fast Python is. So, okay. So we have some more few, uh, features. I already told a few things about that. Um, I'm not going into details because I see the time is running short. But now, the speed. To really accelerate um, Pirate, we had a master thesis um, uh, last year, um, actually finished this year, and it used the Raiden Race API. Raiden Race API is a ray tracing kernel where you can do um, one thing, you shoot rays and you check if it hits something. It's really very, very simple. And it uses internally OpenCL um, to support different GPUs and CPUs. And for our experiments, we used um, the NVIDIA GeForce um, 1080Ti. Um, it's, it has 8 GB of memory, um, a, a memory bandwidth of 320 gigabyte per second. Really nice. And a theoretical um, compute power of 11 teraflops. I'm not going into details here, you can look that up. If you bought an 11 teraflops machine 20 years ago, you yeah, you need several billions and billions of dollars to do that, or euros, it doesn't matter, <laughs> it's this much. Okay, so let me show the result. <laughs> so if you uh, use na uh, native, I call it native Python, um, we, on, on, on my machine we came up with 12,000 rays per second. Yeah. And if we use, we still use Python, of course, and the GPU, we have almost 90 million rays per second, so it's really a big increase of compute power. So um, let's look a little bit at, at um, lighting models. One um, very nice and, and easy to program um, lighting model is the ambient occlusion model. It's, it results, if you compare with, with no lighting or with the classic plain phone, it really looks much better, and, and, but it's a, it's a fake, actually. It's, a, it's not a real global illumination, but it just looks good, basically. And it's quite easy to implement. Yeah, of course, yeah, you could. <laughs> no, it's, it's really easy. You just shoot a ray, and then you see how many rays, if you shoot it again, hit. Um, an object, so you get an occlusion um, a number, and if many, many um, rays hit another object, then it's darker. And if, for example, no ray is hit, or almost no ray is hit, so it's lighter. So it's a really simple to implement um, uh, solution. So um, in the master thesis of Marcus Fair, he implemented that, and the result looks not too bad. So if we have if we, we see the number here, you can check, you can test different number of rays again. If we use a number of 200, it already looks quite well. You can uh, use a filter to increase the quality. And if you compare this with the regular plain phone, a city model, for example, looks, I think it looks much nicer. And if you go, if you zoom in to a city model, you see if you compare it with the uh, plain phone used in real-time graphics, mostly okay. You can also use ambient occlusion in real-time graphics if you look at computer games. But it looks really um, quite, quite good. Or another scene um, recently created looks really much better if you invest some time with a good lighting model. So um, we come back to the occlusion map. So we want to have a map at the end, so this movie shows how to create such a map where you can really um, interact with, this is, you can um, pre-calculate, you could also pre-calculate some movement if you want, but you need really lots of frames, and, and do a really interactive um, view of, of, this, of this city. So um, this year we had another master thesis, we come back to the OpenStreetMap dataset, so we wanted to have a global way to render all buildings of the world with OpenStreetMap data. So um, the solution the student came up with was, um, why don't we just take the OpenStreetMap 2D map and just put the buildings on it 3D? So from the side, so it's a fake, it's 2D and 3D combined, in a, but it looks, it looks not too bad. 
So we did this with, with um, New York City. Here is um, a scene um, with, with a satellite image from Mapbox combined with, the, with this um, render technique. And let me show you quickly a live demo, if I have time. Do I have time? Okay. Oh, I have 10 minutes. Great. So I was too fast already, so we have to wait for the projector, which seems to be slow today. No problem. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory here. Um, one second. Let me make a demo one. That's actually New York City, you see. This is just um, Manhattan, basically, or part of it. And you can zoom in. Now I hope I have internet connection. It's great to have a conference with a slow internet connection, I always say at this point, because if it's slow, you really see something. <laughs> yeah. So that's, in the, in the background, you see the normal OpenStreetMap data. And in the front, you see the buildings rendered. So that's about how it looks like. And then you can say, OK, I don't want, you see here is, it was slow, great. So you see how it, it quickly loads in this slow connection. And you can also change the, the view direction here. We only made uh, four from each side. Of course, you could have more if you want. It's always a, a, a matter of cost of the, of the cloud storage, basically. And here you can also see the normals. You can have a color map. So here um, it's just the colors. And to def map. However, the def map you can't really see anything because it makes no sense. It's um, one um, float stored as image per pixel. So you use um, in this case 32 bits per per pixel and store that as as an image. So why an image? So you can download it from the cloud and process it again and and convert it to a normal def map. So that's basically the demo I wanted to show. See, isn't it great? So it's really, uh, it's really the 2D, if, if you look here, it's really a 2D map from, from top. It's, it's the standard OpenStreetMap. So it's, it's really OpenStreetMap. Now it's slow. OK, now the internet connection is dead. But it's a 2D map from top. And on top, we, we add these 3D buildings. So it's really a fake, but it looks really like, like 3D. And we can do that. Um, that's the nice thing on the, on the whole planet. So let me show a second demonstration of a city which doesn't have nice shapes, the city of Basel, where I live. Uh, here, too, you can just zoom in, and it's 2D map overlaid. There are some um, buildings. For example, this Roche Tower here is, is um, Someone really did the work and added it to OpenStreetMap. Now we just have to wait. If everyone, if every person in a city creates one <laughs> building, <laughs> then we have a nicer map. And you see, this is how it works. And it's really fast for, uh, for the internet. OK, it's a combination JavaScript and Python again, but I think it's, it's a good way. So let me come slowly to the end so we can have Q&A. I know this projector will be slow. So, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's... Okay, let me start with the conclusion already while we wait for the image. <laughs> we saw Pirate, oh, it's here, great. Uh, we saw Pirate, an open source ray tracer, which has been written completely in Python with some additions like um, the, the Raiden Rays API, which is OpenCL and C++. Um, but because it's pay Python, I think the code is, is really, at least from the Python part, the code is readable and understandable. And we already support some different lighting um, models. I, I didn't modes, and I didn't really um, show you all of them yet. Um, uh, with GPU acceleration, we really have a fast solution. And we already used Pirate in several projects. Um, one was this recent master thesis with the, with the open sweep amp data. And we also have another project ongoing, which I can't show at the moment because of some contracts. <laughs> but there, um, Pirate is used too. 
And Outlook, we are currently um, refactoring the master thesis a little bit to put it on GitHub very soon. And um, in future, we also want to use more ray tracing kernels. For example, in Intel has the Embry um, ray tracing kernel, which is CPU based, which doesn't use the GPU, but is, is still very fast because it uses all the modern things of a, of a CPU. And um, soon there will be another master thesis which will add more Terra and, and um, other, other things to, to the ray tracer. So, thank you very much for your attention. So, thank you very much, Martin, for, for this absolutely fantastic talk. Um, since there's no uh, session after this, I think we have some time for questions, so feel free. Thanks. When you say uh, you use GPU to accelerate uh, py pirate, uh, uh, what do you mean? I mean, how pirate can access to the GPU? Do you use any some PyCuda wrapper or something else? Uh, it, it's a wrapper. The, 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 CPU, uh, the GPU part is completely written in C, C++, and then we have bindings and, and call these, these functions. However, this is just an uh, uh, optional uh, way. So. Basic ray tracer, you can you can uh, you don't need a GPU, uh, you just have to wait and you get the same <laughs> result. Hello, very nice talk. Um, what is the precision, or do you care usually so you know, what is the precision of the intersection, all the, the, the mathematics that is there? That is, if you place your camera far, far away, like 700 kilometers away, like a satellite would, would look the same spot, and you have this kind of precision on a very, very tiny place. I mean, if you want to simulate something like a satellite image, do you have enough precision or you, you know that you don't care so you, you know that something is missing? Yes, we have enough precision. There are some tricks. There are several tricks actually to increase the precision. One very simple trick is to have, for example, several um, view frustums and you decide which view frustum you use depending how far the object is. However, this, this solution has problems. There is a very elegant uh, solution by using virtual cameras where you have an offset in the camera and you just set this offset to zero, zero, zero and offset all your geometry in real time. And then you can have really from, from far to near, you can have um, the whole planet and you can zoom to, to, um, to a house, even inside a house without, without losing precision there. Because you always have floating point precision it's in, in, this, in this case because um, in, the, in the virtual globe, for example, you are limited to, to floating points because it's, it's the, the way the GPU handles the data at the moment to be compatible with all common GPUs. In the ray tracer, we use double precision for everything and we can have, of course, a little bit better precision, especially for, for the deep map. This is very important um, because we want to measure in the sub-millimeter um, range. So we have some use cases um, where we want to, to um, for example, uh, measure some cracks in, in uh, restraining walls or dams, and there we really need to sub millimeter. And there we can create normal maps and depth maps with this um, precision. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk. Um, I am wondering, did you consider um, trying to use real-time path tracing for like with a bunch of tricks, of course, uh, in order to simplify the image storage and everything. Um, that's an option. I'm open for that, of course. Um, but in the first version, we, we don't want to, to use that. It's just a decision to, to advance the project more quickly. But in, in future, we can, we can have it. We can add. It's, it's highly um, abstracted. The render is really um, this abstracted that you can write whatever you want, and, and it should work. Okay then, thanks again.